When the Buddha discovered the Great Way, his very first teaching was on the Eightfold Path, the seventh pillar of which is right mindfulness. And shortly after the Buddha attained enlightenment, he sat with a group of children and passed around a basket of tangerines. And as each child held a tangerine, inhaled its fragrance, peeled its skin, and then savored its taste, the Buddha used the tangerines as a teaching tool to instruct them on right and wrong mindfulness. Unfortunately, we don't have tangerines to pass to each of you today. But 2,500 years later, the teaching on mindfulness is more relevant than ever. The moderator for this panel on right and wrong mindfulness is the founder of the Brahm Center, a secular charity that promotes happier, healthier, more mindful living, Angie Chu. Thank you, Brian. So welcome back. And uh, I see that many people have disappeared, so I'm not sure whether because they all know about mindfulness or <laughs> they're just mindfully going into the toilets. Uh, I have with me three distinguished speakers. So I'm just noticing they're all men. And uh, so on my left is uh, Reverend Keo, who is a resident minister at the Berkeley Buddhist Temple, a Pure Land Buddhist tradition that has the largest following in Japan uh, and has been introduced to the US uh, over 120 years ago. He was born and raised in Hiroshima. Reverend was ordained in 1999 and has spent the last two decades in the US. And he has a PhD in Jodo Shinshu Buddhism and an MA in Comparative Studies between Jodo Shinshu and Christianity in Berkeley. Then on my far right is Dr. P.L. Wapola, and he's a primary care physician working in a primary care setting uh, in Toronto, educating doctors and patients on mindfulness. After completing his degree in medicine, he completed a PhD in cardio research. And he has developed a keen interest in Buddhist practice of mindfulness meditation and sutta study and has been in collaboration with University of Toronto on research. And on my right is the youngest, I believe, of the three here. He was born in Tasmania, Australia, so we might be expecting an Australian drawl. Uh, he has a PhD in Buddhist philosophy and cognitive neuroscience. His primary interest is in how contemporary society meets ancient wisdom traditions. He works in conjunction with the Mind and Life Institute and has his contemplative training in the Thai forest and Burmese traditions. So before we start, I'd just like to take this opportunity, which I didn't take it early on, to thank two very special people who put this conference together. Uh, two years ago when uh, they approached me and Arjun Brahm and said, could they organize the conference? Uh, I think they had no idea how ginormous the uh, effort's gonna be, and the first thing Diana said to me when I arrived here is, I'm gonna kill you. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank these two special people, Diana Chen and Coleman Fung. Can we give them a resounding round of applause for their efforts? So as the panel uh, topic here today is right and wrong mindfulness, I will get them to start on the right foot. So uh, Reverend, if you would, please start by defining what do you, how would you define right mindfulness? And bear in mind the panelists, whatever you say could be challenged, so please go ahead. So how long can I talk? <laughs> yeah. Just define that. <laughs> yeah. Concisely. Uh, yeah, minister, the priest, monk, always talk too long, so I, I better, you know, ask beforehand. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to all staff and uh, our committee members who you know, put all things together today. So uh, being uh, uh, mindful of where I am today, I really appreciate so many you know, causes and conditions, and then I really appreciate you know, all of you who come here to listen to the Dharma. So the, to me, uh, as a Buddhist practitioner, mindfulness, uh, so to me, Buddhism is a teaching to deal with suffering. And then when we think about the cause of suffering, who is the cause of suffering? My wife? Is this videotaping? Maybe I shouldn't talk about lots of my wife, right? So uh, my wife or my boss, my friend, we always try to find who is wrong, right? Who brings me suffering and trouble, right? I think that's not the way to you know, try to solve 
the suffering, trouble in your life from Buddhist perspective. So maybe the suffering, you know, this guy is the cause of all suffering and even giving trouble to other people. So to me, mindfulness, especially in Buddhist context, is to know ourselves, to be mindful of who I am or how I live my everyday life. And then by doing so, we can have a different perspective of suffering, trouble, hardship in everyday life. And then I think that's the first step we can start dealing with or kind of starting a treatment of suffering. So in that sense, uh, right mindfulness, especially from, uh, since I'm a Buddhist practitioner, from Buddhist perspective, uh, right mindfulness in the context of Buddhism is kind of to know myself, to know who I am. Okay, thank you, Reverend. So over to you, PL. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know whether I'm even qualified to be here because my wife always says my mind is full. <laughs> You're not mindful. So, so anyway, uh, the, the term mindfulness uh, was first uh, coined by Rice Davis in 1818. Uh, that's a long time ago. So it was translated uh, from Pali word sati. Sati means ability to remember. So he uh, uh, termed the uh, uh, term sati as mindfulness, translates sati as mindfulness. So for my, uh, mindfulness can be different. The faculty of mindfulness can be different from right mindfulness. I can come back to it a little bit later. So. Uh, right mindfulness is a part of the Eightfold Path, whereas faculty of uh, mindfulness, which is uh, uh, found in Indriya Vibhanga Sutra, it, he talks about the ability to remember what's said a long time ago. That's like a more memory. So we can talk in terms of memory later on, if you like, but uh, I want to make that, uh, this uh, uh, difference at the onset. So right mindfulness is a part of the path, at the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which after passing through uh, right view, starting with the right view, uh, right intention, right speech, that right intention will lead to right speech, right action, right livelihood, and then you put the right effort to keep this up, and eventually will, uh, the seventh factor being right mindfulness, which leads to, if you practice it right, right meaning samma, the word samma is uh, translated right, but it's not the ordinary uh, language sense of right and wrong, it is the just right, enough to reach the next step of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right concentration, or Ajahn Brahm calls it uh, the right stillness, which is, I think, is a better term. So along that path, do you have a definition for wrong mindfulness? Wrong mindfulness, is, it starts from the wrong view, with ignorance. Ignorance is, uh, is not, not having uh, the knowledge, it's, it's more that it's a willed ignorance. People don't want to accept the truth as it is. So from there, with ignorance leads to wrong view and wrong intention and so on. So wrong speech, wrong, um, wrong action, wrong livelihood, uh, wrong um, effort, and it leads to uh, wrong mindfulness, which is called micha sati in Pali. Thank you. Reverend, do you have a definition for wrong mindfulness? Yeah, so uh, I talked about uh, from, since I'm a Buddhist practitioner, from Buddhist perspective, know, know yourself. So maybe to me, the, uh, the definition of wrong mindfulness would be kind of uh, try to be mindful without knowing myself, just trying to figure out things all around us without looking into ourselves. Thank you. So Julian. What's your view on mindfulness and how do you see that as part of our uh, existence today, given the troubled world that we're in from your research? Um, <clears throat> um, just quickly before I answer that, i uh, just correct that um, my current doctorate is in Buddhism and cognitive neuroscience. However, my actually complete doctorate is in literature and philosophy, so I didn't want to falsely claim that. Um, so my work with mindfulness it is a bit different. It focuses more on secular mindfulness um, and socially engaged Buddhism. So it 
looks at what's emerging with the mindfulness revolution, particularly in the United States, but in Australia and globally. Um, as probably everyone here is aware, it's this, a massive growing industry, multi-billion dollar industry, um, which is informing a lot of the different industries, uh, including the military, including education, healthcare, um, and at the intersection of um, Buddhist philosophy and contemplative practices and Western science is this friction point. Um, what is going to happen there? Is there a genuine dialogue that is going to take place? Or are we talking about um, more of an imperialistic or colonialistic adoption of contemplative practices by the West? What role and what relationship does this bear to capitalism and neoliberalism um, in a society where productivity is um, the real god? Um, is mindfulness going to be simply co-opted to make us more profitable members of that society? Um, those are the questions I'm interested in. Great. So, Reverend, do you see a problem with secular mindfulness or mindfulness being uh, extracted from the Buddhist um, tradition and promoted in itself? Do you see that as an issue? And if so, in what way? So, yeah, I think uh, mindfulness is very now, you know, catchy and a broad word. And then we can see mindfulness everywhere, right? So there are some uh, mindfulness kind of outside of the context of Buddhism. So, uh, so I think that's fine. So I should, there should be many different types of uh, mindfulness. But uh, uh, I, as a Buddhist uh, minister, and then who propagate, encourage people to live with Dharma. So I want to see people, so if you practice mindfulness, I think it's better, nice, to you know, look at yourself, and then try to change yourself, and then eventually leading to the change the world, right? <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, you know, so the, uh, in the, his uh, keynote today, he talked about change the world. That, that's how uh, Buddhism can change the world, being mindfulness. Each of us is transformed. And then eventually this world could be changed, more peaceful, harmonious society. Thank you. How about you, Pierre? What's your view? Uh, secular mindfulness uh, movement started actually when uh, John Kibbutz Singh in uh, uh, 1990, um, started this uh, medicalizing uh, mindfulness uh, to a treatment program. Uh, Buddha never intended uh, this uh, as a treatment program. Uh, the original intention was to end suffering. And uh, this was uh, confirmed by Richard Davidson recently, 2017. He published, he said, uh, the uh, mindfulness is not for treatment per se, it is to end suffering. And uh, John Kabat Singh went back uh, in 2011 and kind of uh, backtrack a bit and he said uh, Buddhist practitioners, uh, mindfulness, secular mindfulness practitioners should have a strong background in Buddhist practice. So initially he tried to separate the two, then later he went back and said this is important part, uh, the, 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 especially this, uh, the uh, spiritual part more than is the virtues, part of virtue is a kind of part we need to come into this. Uh, mindfulness. So secular mindfulness is, uh, I mean, it's, there are advantages. I mean, there are lots of uh, studies. As there are some uh, randomized studies as well uh, recently that is, uh, um, uh, which is uh, shown that mindfulness is good as a drug in uh, treating relapse in depression. So, so it all depends on the goal, end goal. We want to end suffering. Here's the path, the eightfold path. But if you want to have stress reduction, this is something for you. I mean, it's just like eating an apple. It's, even if you eat the skin, it's very beneficial, it's some fiber. But if you eat the whole apple, that's something different. Well, I would say that for most of us, uh, we're not aiming for enlightenment in this life, so we're not ending complete suffering, right? I mean, many people would even say, I'm looking forward to my next life. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So if we were to embrace and practice mindfulness to improve the quality of our life now, I mean, is that really a problem, uh, especially among the monastics? Um, yeah. Even some monastics are not really going for enlightenment in this life. Yeah, <laughs> so, so what's your view on this uh, in terms of, yes, this is uh, now a big industry, and, but religion has always been a big industry. So what's the difference? Mm. 
Good, good question. Um, I think Pial just spoke really well to the fact that there is a danger that mindfulness will be can result in the reduction of Buddhist Dharma to a therapeutic technique. And I think most of the monastics here would see that a, a loss inherent in that. And that comes to questions of what is being transmitted with mindfulness-based stress reduction, dialectical behavior therapy, um, ACT, and a whole range of other therapeutic techniques using Buddhist practices. Um, like, for instance, there's often a focus solely on impermanence or present moment awareness, not so much on the two truths or on emptiness of phenomena. So, like, I think that those, there are those questions about whether we want, whether that's the danger, the loss of, like, essential parts of the Dharma in the secularization of the practice. So this is on the basis that we are assuming that the monastics have been teaching meditation uh, and for a period of time, it wasn't the case. Uh, in fact, if anything, I would attribute that John kabat has done an amazing job in incorporating mindfulness in a secular way, and therefore it's now being adopted uh, in both the education and also the uh, medical context. So don't you think that's really been a boost yeah. rather than been a boost? Uh, you know, definitely, a, I should a contextualize. I, I definitely don't think that mindfulness is a bad phenomena or that the revolution is... Um, an unfortunate thing. Um, I think we just have to be, you have to question how it's done and how it's transmitted and what other forces are in play. Because um, it always comes into a context. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the, the flow on effects of mindfulness spreading could be really positive. We just have to make sure we're aware. Like some people would like mindfulness to be this apolitical thing, but it's always in a political context. So it has it will carry whatever the society it comes into has. And that's how cultural acculturation happens. Like, Buddhism has changed from every culture that it has entered. But um, it's a question of, yeah, how we'd like to see it develop and grow. Well, as you mentioned politics, interestingly, uh, the UK, through the Oxford University, published the uh, Mindful Nation Report. This is in 2012. And Tim Ryan, congressman of uh, US, has, uh, in fact, been pushing uh, as well um, a Mindful Nation report. Sorry, that was 2012, and UK was in 2015 by Oxford. So yes, it's political uh, in some sense, but wow, don't you think it would be a, a great thing if Trump became more mindful? <laughs> I don't think there are also if that mindful, was ever possible. Yeah, yeah. There, there are mindful snipers as well. Like that's my question is around like ethics has been carved off by the mindfulness movement as it's come in secular society. So. There's a question of what aspects you know, of the Dharma we're losing out. Like if Trump just becomes more attentive and concentrated, that's not necessarily going to be a positive thing for the world. <laughs> yes, PL, you have some, uh, something to comment on? Yes. Uh, I think the, the definition uh, of John Kabat Singh's was uh, non, uh, the word, the key word was non judgmental awareness. Uh, that's kind of misleading uh, because. Uh, in Buddhist teachings, uh, Buddha never talk about non-judgmental. There is always skillful judgment going on. Buddha actually took a metaphor, mindfulness as a gatekeeper. This is a skillful gatekeeper. He knows he's, he's mindful, he's alert, and he knows what's going on. So he has a get a feedback, atapi, sampajano, satima. These are the three uh, essential qualities of right mindfulness. Atapi means you need, have to put the effort, the right effort to discriminate between skillful and unskillful. Uh, Sampajano is the feedback, that is the more wisdom part of it. Uh, and the Satima is to remember to do that repeatedly. So, so, so this is a skillful gatekeeper. So it's, sometimes this word non judgmental awareness uh, can be misleading in this uh, uh, original definition of John Kabat Singh. So I, I believe uh, this is uh, sometimes get too diluted over time and now it's becoming more like a fast food, like a Mac mindfulness and so on. So it's, it's got to be careful this when you, when you define these things. And also there's no consensus. Even the scientists now come to uh, the last paper on mind hype. They're talking about there is no consensus on the definition. Even the, in the research can be problematic in the future. So they are at a crossroad right now trying to define mindfulness. So, Biko Analeo uh, specifically, uh, recent paper 2018, he said we need to inject uh, more 
a textural like a depth into mindfulness from sutras. So I think uh, getting into the four foundational mindfulness is a very important part of the, the right mindfulness uh, definition. So I think that there's always uh, been a contention in how uh, John Kabat-Zinn's uh, definition has sometimes been misinterpreted. Uh, when he defines paying attention in the present moment non-judgmentally, uh, what he was trying to do is to say that can we be present without the biasness and the prejudice so we can be really aware of the situation as is. Uh, so it's not to say that won't be judgment. I don't think our mind is capable of just uh, not having thoughts and making judgment is how to be able to consciously put that aside so we could interact with an individual or look at the situation without our biasness and the anger that comes with the biasness. So, I mean, as a both uh, having been a Buddhist and also now teaching secular mindfulness, what I see is the uh, attraction of people coming to learn meditation without worrying that they will be converted or they have to be religious and really is ethics unique to religion. I mean, are we saying that a, a free thinker or an atheist is not ethical? I mean, I think sometimes they can be more ethical. So, you know, what's your view, Reverend? Yeah, so, yeah, I think Dharma-centered, maybe I could say Dharma-centered mindfulness is uh, maybe as a Buddhist to, for us to go. And then, so when Dharma is a center of a life or sarma, Dharma, is kind of we live with dharma and then that's how we are improved or transformed ethically and then so that's how you know we can you know maybe see things in a different way or we can start thinking things from a different perspective that's how dharma practically changes our life and it makes us more ethical um yeah um i think that's a really good point and so whilst I, whilst I think that we can talk about the way mindfulness is taught and whether it has a focus on precept keeping, I think there is some research coming out showing that it's more effective um, if it does um, have some ethical orientation. But actually what I'm particularly interested in the moment is Dharmic communities um, and secular Buddhist communities of course, um, which are putting attention into social justice work and into thinking about um, economic um, class system that we have and, and also thinking about climate change. So there's a number of different organizations. Some of you locals might be aware of like San Francisco Dharma Center. Um, there's Eco Dharma in Boulder. There's like a number of emerging Gen X or millennial teachers who have this focus upon structural oppressions and like working that into Dharma transmission, which is a big question. Um, I think there's an interesting point we made earlier that learning Dharma ourselves can change the world in a way, but there's, there has been a, there's a great book called American Dharma by Ang League, which explores a shift that has taken place from um, first generation Dharma teachers um, of the baby boomer generation who had an, a real emphasis upon Dharma being able to change the world, and more recent millennial and Gen X teachers who are aware of all these structural concerns which haven't been addressed and which really need to be considered additionally too. They shouldn't be just ignored or passed over with the assumption that Dharma would suit, would um, resolve all these problems in and of themselves. Um, and they make some, yeah, it's an interesting book to follow up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, follow up? Talking about Dharma, true or false Dharma, uh, Buddha gave a beautiful guideline in the Mahaparinibbana Sutra called the Four Great References. He said, somebody comes and says, this is the teaching of the Buddha, or I have heard from the Buddha himself. Uh, so always go back, trace back to the original teachings, uh, the Dhamma and the Vinaya. And if you, you cannot trace it there, you must say this person is mistaken or just kind of rejected. If you can trace it back word to word to original uh, Dhamma and the Vinaya, then he said, you may accept it. He, he didn't force it. Uh, Dhamma is never forced. It's, he passed to go come and investigate. So this is a beautiful guideline we have. And also, Buddha warned about counterfeit Dhamma in the future. Yeah, there's a sutra called... Did you say counterfeit? Yeah. Okay. Don't yep. you think there's really a lot of counterfeit? It's not for the future, it's now. Uh, it's happening now. <coughs> Buddha, uh, Buddha uh, said that 2,500 years ago, it's happening right now. So he warned, he knew it's going to happen. He said it's like something like gold. 
you, you have gold, but there's another gold which will appear in the future. It will be shinier, more beautiful, it's easy to, it's cheaper. And people would want to use it, but this is, uh, monks, be careful. So with the corrupt dharma will corrupt discipline, corrupt discipline will go corrupt dharma. So this is the decline of the teaching. So you, we need to stop this bleeding. That's, that's why I'm saying we need to come out with a proper uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of definition for right mindfulness. And otherwise, this is good. people are going to take it away. Uh, to the, the fast food chain, like mindfulness. Uh, so I'd like to dwell a little bit on that when you talk about, is it counterfeit uh, dhamma or yeah. counterfeit uh, practices? Because counterfeit even somebody who wears a rope doesn't mean he is practicing the dhamma necessarily, right? Not I mean, Ajahn Ram got kicked out of a monastery because he ordained women. So is that counterfeit uh, dhamma no. practice or is... Counterfeit uh, is the so teaching, the teaching of the sutra being changed into the according to the way you like it. I mean, you like the counterfeit goal because Shiva is easier to use. It's, it's fun, but the real goal will disappear. That's meaning people will try to use more easier techniques. So I'm trying so, to put this in the context of what's happening today. Yeah. So I like to just use the, the example of Ajahn Brahm being expelled from his monastery in Thailand that's a totally different for uh, ordaining women. So who is the counterfeiter? That's, that's a totally, that's a Vinaya thing. I'm talking about no, that. No, let's talk about that, right? No. Because this is real. <laughs> this is a big, uh, big... Like many religions, <laughs> women are not treated equal. Yes. And when um, a man decides to stand up for a woman, he gets expelled. He did the right thing. He thought it was he the right thing. He did the right thing. Yeah. But the people expel him that's, feels that's, that they're doing their, the right thing. So who is the counterfeiter? It's, it's their thinking. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to fit into a certain framework or ideas. Yeah. I mean, you have to do what you think is right at the end for human, uh, end human suffering. If somebody's ready to take on this path, you should, it doesn't matter female or male, you should let them be, let, let them carry on. You know, so you should encourage that. So I think he did the right thing against all, you know. <laughs> so this is, this is what's scary about being right or wrong, right? There is this sense of I'm right and you're wrong. So, yeah. and, and is this the human mind or is this really the Buddhist teachings? Or, you know, we just want to be the righteous one. So, you know, Reverend, what's your view on this? I mean, and if you could explain in Japanese Buddhism, although you're Reverend, you're married, mm -hmm. you've got hair, and, uh, <laughs> and how did this happen? <laughs> Thank you very is this much. right, uh, you know, is this right monasticism or mm -hmm. wrong? So could we explore that? Yeah, uh, so yeah, when I got uh, this uh, topic for our panel, you know, what is right and wrong mindfulness, I started wondering, what does it mean? So who make a judgment right and wrong, right? So always kind of this kind of dualistic, you know, judgment, is issue in Buddhism, right? And then usually our ego, our ignorance is a kind of criteria or, uh, on which we you know, make a decision, this is right, this is wrong, right? So, and then in many cases, because of, based on our ego or ignorance, that's why we humans make a wrong decisions, wrong judgment, right? So that's why uh, here, my right and wrong mindfulness, I think again, Dharma-centered, always Dharma is a center when we make a uh, judgment, we make a decision. I think that's the way to go as a Buddhist. And then, so, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So we are Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, Japanese pure and Buddhism started the uh, uh, 12th century. And then our founder, he uh, was a monk, but uh, somehow he was kicked out. And then I uh, kicked out or kind of he left the uh, monastic life. And then he exposed himself into the, you know, just a common people. And then spreading the Dharma, and then live a kind of similar life as a, a Buddhist. And then I think that's how he started being a mindfulness. How, you know, like a lay people living day-to-day -day life. And then that's how he became more mindfulness, the reality of this samsara, and then how we should address, uh, spread the dharma into those people in suffering in a secular way. So that's how our tradition uh, started. And then uh, we ordained, but uh, we still have a hair, and then we have, you know, Mary, so it's kind of strange, you know, Buddhism, but uh, uh, it works. And then many people kind of uh, attracted to this teaching, right? 
Yeah, so I'm just wondering whether people would call that counterfeit. Yeah. Because it's not exactly what the Buddha introduced in the Vinaya that mm -hmm. you're allowed to marry and, and um, right. you know, not renounce. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is in Vinaya or precept, how about the people who have no time to, you know, no time or no chance to for the monastic life or kind of, especially medieval Japan, the Buddhism is only, you know, part of people, only certain part, you know, group of people. Most people are kind of excluded from the Dharma. So that's why in the Kamakura period, medieval Japan, many Buddhist monks, they left the monastery and then jumped into the you know, populace. And then they started the, uh, teaching the Dharma. And then, so that's how Buddhism spread all through, uh, uh, throughout Japan. So I think this is a kind of big shift or change of Japanese Buddhism, try to, you know, more, uh, not secularize, but to spread the Dharma for all people, like a Mahayana Buddhism, right? Thank you. So Jilin, if I may um, uh, explore your research interest in neuroscience, how has uh, neuroscience supported uh, the development and practice of mindfulness um, in the context of in today's modern world where you don't have to be a, a Buddhist to be practicing meditation? So, um, that's a big question. Um, there's a lot of research coming out about a whole range of different effects that mindfulness practice may or may not have on, on the brain, and a lot of it is very positive, a lot of it's very optimistic. I recently attended the Mind and Life Conference, a summer research institute, which PL has attended, I think, previously, which is m sort of more or less a convergence point for neuroscientists and contemplative scholars. Um, it's really exciting work and it's been a driving force behind the mindfulness revolution. Um, however, the dialogue that takes place is often quite unidirectional, so less a dialogue than a scientific, neuroscientific um, exploration of monks in fMRI machines testing brain waves. And there is, and whilst, yeah, again, whilst it has spread throughout um, the Western world, this is really positive, um, but I think a dialogue should have two directions. I think we need more contemplative scholars and philosophers being able to explore like the actual Dharma, not just whether your brain gets, you know, gets a bit sharper, whether you become a bit more concentrated and alert and um, live longer, whether your telomeres um, don't shrink so rapidly so you like prevent cancer onset. This is great information, but we also need to think about what is what is the Dharma and like how like what is what's being lost in the transmission west? I think um, as PR mentioned earlier, there is a threat. I mean, counterfeit is a difficult term, like you said, because there is constant cultural um, baggage which is being lost and adopted as Buddhism shifts from place to place. But um, I think there's a tendency for power to go unnoted, and at the moment. Um, first, like third-person scientific methods are powerful, um, capitalism and neoliberalism are powerful, and this can often mean that smaller voices get overruled. Thank you. So in my last 10 minutes, I'd like to just get everyone to summarize uh, their points and um, before we close. So, who would like to start? Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, we got to remember this, um, the faculty of mindfulness, I want to make that separation. Uh, from right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is, is the part by the faculty of mindfulness helping that uh, uh, the right mindfulness with, uh, with uh, the right effort, as well as the sampajana part, which is the, uh, this is the feedback part. So all these three things have to be there around the four foundational mindfulness to have a clear definition of right mindfulness. So the focus is the four foundational mindfulness is the mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of thoughts and mental phenomena have to be included. So every time uh, there are beautiful similes, metaphors given in, by the Buddha, every time we get into trouble, we go outside our ancestral domain. There are, uh, there are two uh, similes, uh, the, the story about a hawk, uh, the quail who went outside the domain and a monkey who got caught to the hunter. So every time, so it's, you need to uh, think of in these four frameworks of contemplation of mindfulness uh, to get the full depth of right mindfulness. 
Thank you. Reverend? Uh, so again, so my understanding of, you know, my Buddhist mindfulness is uh, uh, know ourselves. And then by knowing ourselves, we can be uh, changed or we can be transformed. But uh, how? How can we become more mindful of my everyday life? How can we see things more clearly? I think our tradition uh, put much emphasis on the light, light from the Buddha, light from the Dharma. So we humans, maybe we don't have a good eyes to see things as they are, but uh, with the guidance of Dharma, or with the guidance of light of Buddha, especially Amida Buddha, and then now we can see things more clearly. And then that's how we can become more mindful of things all around us. And then, of, of course, myself. And then that's how we practice mindfulness. And then that's how we become changed, transformed. And then by each of us changing this way, and then collectively, society, community has been changed with the power of Dharma. And then this whole world become more peaceful and then wonderful world. Thank you, Reverend. Julian? Um, yeah, I, I'd firstly just like to thank Dharma Darini for taking me in since I've arrived in the United States and to say I've been really blessed to see the intersection of Dharma through these communities and also the secular, Dharma, uh, secular mindfulness movement. So looking at that intersection, I feel like there's so much potential for fruitful dialogue and for global change. Um, however, the concern I'd like to raise, I just end with someone else's words. Um, Slavoj Žižek wrote that mindfulness is establishing itself as the hegemonic ideology of global capitalism. By helping people to fully participate in the capitalist dynamic while retaining the appearance of mental sanity. <laughs> it's, he's known for like big pronouncements, but his concern is that Western Buddhism may provide the perfect ideological supplement for the smooth running of global capitalism. So the concern is just to avoid that happening, to try and ensure that we're aware of the structural realities that we're arriving in when we're practicing, when we're teaching mindfulness secularly and in dharmic communities, and it's not a contextless phenomena. Thank you, Jimin. And I would just like to uh, end the session by saying that I would consider wrong mindfulness coming with the wrong intention on why we teach or why we live a certain way of life. Um, a sniper is very mindful. He is completely focused on getting his target. And the outcome would be harmful because the act of killing is considered harmful by any um, definition of a religion or ethics. So right mindfulness, I would think that it has to do with uh, what is our intention and what is our ultimate goal. Uh, if we're going to be teaching mindfulness for um, creating wealth for ourselves, I would think that that might be a concern. Um, but I would also say that uh, even in religion, uh, some religious leaders are doing it with the uh, goodness of the heart, and some are doing with the uh, intention of accumulating wealth. So it is not to say that the secular teachers are worse or better. I would caution that everyone chooses the teacher that they uh, decide to go with, uh, whether it's secular mindfulness or religious mindfulness or anything for that matter is bias beware. So um, I think that all of us need to access our inner wisdom, follow the Buddha's teachings. Uh, the Buddha himself never said follow him or his successor, but to always follow the teachings. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and thank you the panelists for this session.